chapter six, which is nonverbal communications. And this is another chapter that is very, very full of good information. So we're going to hit as much as we can in the lecture, but you will get a lot more from the reading. So I hope that you are excited about it. And I actually have quite a bit in this lecture, so I'm going to try to get everything covered. So let's go ahead and begin. Let's talk about nonverbal behaviors. And the first question I have for you, how much of effective, assertive behavior is nonverbal? On a continuum of zero to 100, how much would you say effective, assertive behavior comes from nonverbal actions? And that can be something that you choose to reflect about if you'd like. I'm curious to know, because we've talked about how to be assertive now, we've talked about effective communication. So if you combine what you would need to be both of those things, how much of that do you think comes from what you don't say? And then another question, what are examples of effective, assertive, nonverbal behaviors. So I guess you have to define that first before you can answer the first question. So what are maybe two or three effective, assertive, nonverbal behaviors that you can think of? And then how much of those behaviors are nonverbal? Here are some that you may have thought of. Here are some that I have decided I think are appropriate. Eye contact, certainly one of them. Leaning in to show interest in a conversation. Keeping calm facial expressions, very important. Keeping a calm tone of voice. Your body posturing, and the list goes on and on and on, but those are just some things to get you thinking of how you might witness those behaviors non-verbally or how you might act in that assertive, effective, non-verbal behavioral ways. So if we're speaking of nonverbal communications, that was specific to behavior, but if we're thinking about nonverbal communications, let's see if we can come up with a definition for that. On your paper or in your head, whatever you'd like, what would you define nonverbal communications as? And once you've come up with how you might define that or explain that, the official definition is behavior other than written or spoken language that creates meaning for someone. And it is the main channel to communicate feelings and attitudes. So if you're thinking about, we've talked a lot about verbal communication, obviously. So if you eliminate the spoken language element and you eliminate the written language component, behavior other than that creating meaning for someone, remember, interpretation is crucial in communication and the message and the feedback and all of those things. So there has to be meaning for someone for the behavior to be nonverbal communication. And then it is the main way that we communicate feelings and attitudes. We rely on nonverbal cues to predict how others feel about us and how they react to us. And that's interesting because we spend a lot of time talking about how to be effective communicators and how to get the appropriate feedback, ask the qualifying questions to make sure that we're in interpreting things correctly, we paraphrase to confirm understanding, etc. But we actually are using nonverbal cues to predict how others are going to feel about us and react to us. And that's something that we need to be really attuned to because if we're going to be able to predict how others might respond, that helps us be better communicators. And if we can predict how others react to us, very helpful. And unfortunately, most of us have limited awareness of nonverbal communication. And so I'm hoping that at the end of this week, you will say, that is no longer me. I am very well aware of nonverbal communications. So why do we need to learn about this? What is important about nonverbal communication? Like I mentioned, it's the main channel used to communicate feelings and attitudes. And so much of relationships are based around feelings and attitudes. So that's very important. Two thirds of the meaning of a message is nonverbal. So 67% of the meaning in a message is nonverbal. That is a significant percentage. Now, even more significant, 93% of emotional meaning of the message is nonverbal. So 67% of the total meaning as a whole 
but 93% of the emotional meaning comes from our nonverbal cues. So if we're missing the nonverbal communication, we're missing out on a huge, huge element of relationships and interpersonal communication. It's the most significant source of emotional communication for the face. So anytime you're going to focus on nonverbal communication, your first and number one priority is going to be facial expressions. And we'll talk more about those. And we base feelings on what the other person does, not what they say. So we need to keep in mind that, you know, do as I say, not as I do, that old adage. Um, you know, in this particular scenario, what the person does, their behaviors, much more important than what is actually said, because that is what gives us our feelings about the person, about the situation, about the context. So what are functions of nonverbals? Um, they can contradict words sometimes. So the example that I have is if someone goes, I'm not afraid of the dark. No, I'm not, I'm not afraid of the dark at all. As the lights go off in a power outage, for example. You know, what they're saying is, I'm not afraid of the dark, but their eyes are wide and they're looking around and they have that intense panicked look on their face. Clearly their nonverbals are contradicting what their words are saying. You can emphasize or underscore your words. So you can, you know, if you're really impassioned about something, you bang your fist on the table or you wag your finger. Those are actions that will either emphasize or give more weight to what you're saying. So those types of actions are nonverbal functions. It can regulate the flow of communication. In other words, have you ever been in a conversation where you're talking and you see the other person go, and then they stop? That's almost, you know, like an unspoken, I'm ready to say something, but I'm gonna let you continue until you stop to let me get my turn. And so that flow of communication back and forth, even in a classroom, you know, if someone's, if um, a professor's lecturing and a student, you know, kind of lifts their hand or lifts their head or, you know, indicates in some way that they would like their turn, you know, that's a regulation of the flow of communication. You can also complement words with nonverbals. So rather than just saying hello, if you wave and say hello, that's a complement to your word. And then it can also substitute or take the place of spoken words. So in a specific situation where you may not be able to communicate verbally, um, you can use, you know, symbols, which we've talked a lot about, or other nonverbal cues to communicate. So, you know, if you're across a crowded room and you can't hear anything and someone, you know, indicates at, you know, at five o'clock meet at the door and you need to tell them, okay, I get it. You know, what's the symbol for that? Most people would do this. Um, another option might be thumbs up, but we have symbols and substitutes for words in our language. Actually, this is a funny story. Um, the youth pastor at my former church, he and his wife, when they were either early married or even maybe when they were still dating, I'm not sure, um, they were, I want to say, spending time with their niece or someone in their family. Anyway, she was little. She was like two or three. And they were sitting together and she said, you for him and him for you. And that became like their little thing like they would say to each other you for me me for you and so when we would be at conferences or whatever you know and they were across a hotel from each other or whatever they would actually sign you for me um and that was their little thing and you know that took the place of spoken words it was kind of like their i love you um but they would sign you for me and so you know, we do that in relationships. We substitute things non-verbally so that we can communicate, you know, in a special way with people that we care about. Okay, characteristics of nonverbal cues. All nonverbal behavior has message value. So we've talked a lot about messages, right? And so we've said we want to be aware of what the message is and how it's being communicated, the channel, and then we give feedback, etc. Well, every nonverbal behavior has message value. So there's a message no matter what the cue is. Nonverbal communication is ambiguous, meaning it can 
vary with meaning depending on the person, depending on the situation, depending on the environment, depending on the culture. So whereas nonverbal communication cue in one person's experience can mean one thing, it can mean something very different for someone else. Nonverbal communication is primarily relational in nature. And so if we talk about content of communication, that's going to be more spoken. But relational elements mo mainly come from nonverbal. Um, nonverbal behavior provides clues. <sighs> Sorry, I've been trying to hide it, but it had to come out. Um, provides clues to deception. So interestingly, research shows that you only have a 60% chance of detecting if someone's lying to you. So 40% of the time, you miss that you're being lied to. And interestingly, nonverbal behavior can help you key into deception, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And if you want to educate yourself a little more, page 179 actually has a table of nonverbal cues to deception, and it's kind of interesting. And so if you wanted to um, reflect about that, feel free. Oh my goodness. Okay. So nonverbal messages are more believable. Now, um, these are some interesting concepts because we often think that, you know, our nonverbal messages, maybe we don't even consider what they communicate, but if we consider them, often we think, well, you know, I can smile or I can make sure that my face doesn't give me away. Interestingly, nonverbal messages are more difficult to fake. <laughs> 